so please open the uh, practical to uh, Gromox practical to second part of practical in your uh, browser. Uh, here we will do uh, already a real QMM simulations. Uh, but first, I want to do a quick again lecture recap of what you just saw. So, uh, how to deal with QMM, how to deal with point charges, how Gromox interface, CB2K interface deals with them, how it deals with PBC, and so on. Parity power dynamic conditions, yeah. Uh, so, what is JIP? Uh, JIP is a, a QMM coupling scheme which is implemented in CP2K. And uh, how it is working? So basically, this is your whole system now. And you have QM part, and you have MM part, which is green here. And you want somehow to uh, uh, to include effect from the MM point charges into the QM system. Uh, how it is done in CP2K? You expand each of your uh, Gaussian electrostatic potential, which is just Coulombic potential, yeah, it's one over R uh, potential. You expand them in uh, in a sense like uh, sum of several Gaussians, uh, and then you project that Gaussians onto the multigrid of your uh, QM system, like you do with QM uh, in the same way like you're doing. Uh, these uh, QM basis functions, uh, Gaussian basis functions. So this kind of unified model. And the only thing which remains is that uh, our low term. Uh, so you have now uh, several Gaussians. You expand your whole potential into Gaussians, some of Gaussians plus some re remaining part. But that remaining part is so smooth and, uh, and, and small that it could be projected directly onto the uh, like coarsest possible grid. Uh, so this is how the jeep working. So instead of Coulombic potential, you use now a potential which consists of several Gaussian functions plus some remnants. Uh, and you project them onto the multigrid and you directly uh, then use it from that multigrid uh, into the QM. Uh, it kind of, that multigrid is already embedded into your QM simulations. Uh, it's the same multigrid. Okay. Why it is important? Because, for example, now we want to do fully periodic QMM and how it's usually done. Oh, how it's not usually done, but how it's done in CP2K. It's also a very funny thing because it employs both JEEP and some additional scheme. So what you're doing? So you first project your uh, MM. CP2K is doing that. It projects your MM point charges onto uh, using the JEEP onto the QM part. So like that. Now you have system like that in a small quantum box. So quantum box is usually much smaller than the whole system box, uh, that green box. Uh, then what you calculate in reality in CP2K, you calculate that thing. So you calculate periodic QM box like that, and you converge uh, using the quick step, the density of that uh, box, the electron wave function, if you want to say, you want to say it like that. But in reality, you calculate periodic system. But if you check, well, now, unless you have the same uh, dimensions of the QM and the MM box are the same, you have a wrong periodicity, yeah? Because you, your initial system was like that, yeah? So it was here, here, and here boxes. But now it is looking like that, which is not correct. And to correct that uh, in CP2K, CP2K uses so-called Blochel scheme, uh, which is from the paper, I guess. So what it is doing, it basically takes the density uh, of the, uh, takes the QM density, the multigrid, then it uh, calculates interaction with, uh, with a periodic cell, with itself basically, yeah, with periodic images of itself. Then it removes it completely, uh, the interaction with periodic cell. Then it shifts your QM system into the correct position in space. Uh, and then it recouples them back. So basically it calculates again the interaction between the uh, QM system, in, in periodic images of the QM system between themselves, but with a correct distance. So it do it like that. So it shift and then it decouple, it's so-called decoupling and recoupling scheme. So first you decouple your uh, system image with its own periodic uh, images. So you basically split the system and then you recouple them back with the correct periodicity with the correct distance between them. You, you, you uh, already have a correct 
your MLM system. Uh, okay, it should be seen now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. Uh, so. Okay, so this is how the QMM will work, and this is how we uh, re-implement them kind of in Gromax. Uh, so let's go to the tutorial. Uh, let's make them. Uh, let's do the real QMM uh, system. First system we'll do will be uh, the same still band molecule, but now in a box of tip three waters. Uh, please do uh, steps one to four of exercise three. Enric uh, ask a question about the cell dimensions. Uh, so how they are generated? Yes. So basically there is two cells. I, I will show later. Uh, so the full uh, cell is directly MM cell. Is directly inherited from the Gromax. Uh, and QM cell dimensions is calculated automatically at the Grom PP level, yes. So you don't need to worry about this. You still can adjust it. I will show again tomorrow how you can adjust it if you want. But it uh, it will create a large enough QM cell that your QM system will be inside that. Yes. In general, this Grom, uh, Thomas asks, if in general is Grom CP2K, I can use standard NDP files and add CP2K parameters flat or some NDP files need to be just yes. So in general, uh, just standard Gromax MTP file, just add this uh, CP2K, uh, uh, Gromax CP2K interface uh, stuff, which I already showed you, uh, several parameters, and it will automatically switch. But make sure that, for example, your output uh, is that NST out. Uh, options are set to a proper value or else you probably will never see any results because yeah, usually it's set up in classical simulations quite some out please output uh, structure every 10,000 10, steps or something like that yeah which will never happen so it's always better to to reduce these uh, kind of things but in general if you can run with the same setup uh, you have the simulations. You can easily switch to QMMM using just these parameters, which I showed you in the CP2K uh, in, in that CP2K description. I mean, in case of pure uh, CP2K QMMM input files, do the cell dimension into the sentiment? Yes, in pure CP2K, you need to set the cell dimensions manually, and you need to consider that your cell QM cell is large enough to contain all your QM atoms. Yeah. Uh, role of dispersion interaction between two atoms molecules in QMMM. Thanks and once. Okay, uh, so here you need to we need to consider two things. So even three things. You have a dispersion interaction between the MM and the MM atom. You have dispersion interaction between MM and QM atom, and you need dispersion interaction between QM and QM atom. So between the MM and the MM, they are taken into account by the Van der Waals parameters of your MM force field. Between QM and the MM atoms, they are also inherited from the Van der Waals interaction, inherited from the force field. So your QM atom field repels MM atoms also with Van der Waals parameters. Between QM and QM atoms, you need uh, to use usually this dispersion correction. If you want to use such kind of things, you need to use dispersion corrections. For example, Grimme, uh, Grimme dispersion corrections, which will be again discussed tomorrow. Uh, and this is exactly what you want to do if you need them. Uh, as, but the role, the role is there is a role. Yeah. Uh, if you do not set up uh, dispersion tracks, for example, between QM and the MEM atoms, uh, then you could see a collapse of your wave function at some points <laughs> because your MM point charge gel we just well there is I think in the lecture that was discussed this uh, kind of collapse problem when your electron uh, from the QM part will be just stripped off of the QM part and just try to collapse onto the MM point charge because the MM point charge come too close and there is no barrier to do that and the dispersion interactions like Van der Waals they are adding this uh, low uh, adding this repulsive uh, behavior on the very low distances so that will never happen uh, yeah 
So there is also called polarization catastrophe, some kind of points of over, uh, hyper -polar over polarization wave function, but yeah, this is a known problem. And to overcome that, usually QM atoms still repulse the MM atoms with Van der Waals interactions from inheritance from the force field. Uh, what are the disadvantages of setting up QM cell sites and a MM cell size the same. Uh, yeah, there is very one uh, huge disadvantage that the bigger uh, your QM cell is, the more plane waves can fit inside that. The more plane waves can fit inside the QM box, the harder your simulation will be. For example, uh, if you increase your cell size, QM cell size by a factor of two, your simulations will be uh, slower by a factor of eight to 16, I guess. So it's always, you should always choose a QM box such as it large enough to contain all your QM atoms, uh, plus some uh, additional space, of course. And it should be, but it, sh it should not be big so that your simulation will be very slow. Uh, yeah, this, that's why usually you do not set up them the same. You can in principle, but there is makes no sense at all because the uh, uh, calculation, QM calculation will be not feasible. You will have too many plane waves. Uh, yeah, basically. Okay, uh, I think we can continue. So uh, let's move on to our uh, uh, let's check how your uh, QM input changed, uh, how CP2K input changed once you uh, once you set up your system already with some point charges. So, and first of all, we should go to that. Uh, so basically, do that less. Oh, okay. Oh, please open with less that uh, CP2K input file uh, and uh, uh, go to that QMMM section in that and it should look like that so and the uh, qm region is this section it defines the parameters to deal with qmm uh, to deal with point charges inside the cp2k in general so basically here is again the cell but this cell is not the same as in subsys cell and this is your qm, your QM cell so qm cell uh, is defined automatically as already have been asked it defined on on the, uh, defined on the during the at the ground PP level on the basis of dimensions of your QM system which you supply to the Gromax. So again, it's fully periodic. Here is a couple Gauss and UGPLIP twelve. It is uh, your cap QMM coupling scheme and Gauss means uh, using JIP reality coupling scheme and uh, use JIPLIP. It's uh, just the number of Gaussians which you want to use in JIP expansion. The more Gaussians, the harder will be the more the harder will be your uh, simulation, but the more precise it will be. Uh, yeah. Uh, e and regarding the question of Shudrashan, uh, yes, uh, the coupling is defined automatically. There is some default behavior. Uh, of the Gromax CP2K interface. But again, you can change it. Uh, tomorrow I can show you how you can change it. Uh, a, a way how to, you can change it. Uh, also, Shiv asked, could uh, we use dispersion interaction energy to establish stability of complex or um, portal link and cycle again? Uh, I would say no, <laughs> because it's too really too hard. Your complex, uh, usually your complex uh, is not uh, defined by the dispersion interactions only. It defined, I can say mostly by, if your complex is not covalently bound complex, then it defined mostly by the Columbic interactions. So you need always to take into account all kinds of interactions you have in the complex. Uh, yes. Okay, let's continue with uh, uh, searching to the QMM. So uh, next, what we see is that uh, how we treat the periodicity in our QMM. This is using of that Blackwell scheme. So there is a periodic keyword. So, and there is uh, some default parameters like multiple on, and this uh, uh, this is uh, in, in for you to case that need to use Bluffle scheme to decouple and recouple. 
Uh, you can also open CP2K out file with less, CP2K output file with uh, extension dot out, uh, the one that appears in your directory. And you can see that uh, in SCF cycles, sometimes uh, you will see this uh, decoupling energy and recoupling energy. This actually that global scheme. So decoupling, it means that interaction with uh, uh, with uh, uh, removing interaction with uh, incorrect interaction with periodic box and recoupling is one that shifted back. Okay, and uh, the next uh, sec in the next section you see for each kind of atoms uh, indexes uh, of the atoms which should be QM. So basically the list of indexes which should be QM. It's also automatically generated and for each kind of atoms which are uh, seen in the QM sieve system. Uh, from the other side, if you check the MM section, you will see that everything here basically switched off. So because Gromax fully handles description of the MM region, so you switch off the non-bonded forces, you switch off uh, evil summation, you switch off PME. So you, you don't do anything with MM. It just informs that uh, CP2K that it doesn't need to do anything here. Uh, and in the topology section, there is a very important thing, also automatically generated, but here is a PDB file uh, from which the CP2K picks up the point charges, actually. Uh, and it picks up from the extended beta field, which starts at column 81 in the PDB file. Uh, it uh, From starting from that column, it starts the point charge in that file. So it does not produce any connectivity. And it just generates topologies as a later arms because uh, MM, uh, because interactions, bonded interactions also will be treated by Gromax. You don't need to do that. Okay. Uh, now, uh, yeah. So if you again look into that still bin, uh, so opt input, you will see that only the atoms which are, uh, belongs to still bin is marked as a QM atoms, everything else will be treated as MM atoms. Uh, and there is how the uh, PDB file, that uh, PDB file looks like generated. So basically here starts, here is a splitting between two residue names, QM and MM. Yeah, I think it's self-explanatory. Uh, so the QM is QM atoms, MM is MM atoms. And here starts the uh, point charge. So you see that all QM atoms have a zero point charge. It's nullified. And all MM atoms have some point charge. Uh, here, for example, you can see that these three atoms form the deep 3P water. Pretty yeah, remarkable point charges of deep 3P water. Uh, OK, but uh, anyway, let's see uh, what is the uh, uh, outcome of the exercise three. I think it should finish and you can do this uh, remaining part of the exercise three, uh, which is from five to, ah, no, it's not remaining part. Wait, it's from five to seven first, that energy minimization. And if you do that, if you again extract the potential energy, you will see something like that. And this I've just rendered your trajectory of that optimization. And you see that your energy, so there is much more steps that you have done, but uh, yeah, you'll see how the energy minimizes uh, again. So yeah, I guess now you can do the steps seven to nine. So now you, instead of the optimization, you again run the molecular dynamics using the NVT ensemble. Actually, NPT is also working, so in case you uh, wondering, can use a pressure coupling? Yes, you can use pressure coupling. Uh, yeah, but for that, so just use this one. Is uh, so Thomas asking, uh, is one femtosecond type set standard for QMM calculations? Well, it's a very good question. <laughs> what time step you should use? Uh, normally, I would say yes. In most uh, cases, one femtosecond type step is kind of good uh, for the QMM uh, molecular dynamics, except of several uh, important things. So you should know why, how you choose a time step. For example, in normal classical microdynamics, you should choose your time step according to the uh, 
vibrations of your hydrogen atoms because it means that uh, vibrations of your uh, bonds of your, some of your bonds should be uh, period of that period of that vibration should be large enough that your molecular dynamics is sampled correctly and or or you can use uh, constraints instead of the bonds yeah so there is a constraints uh, for example, in Gromax, if you set up constraints, you can use even higher uh, time steps, like not one femtosecond, but two to three femtoseconds. But for that, you need to use constraints because, or else, your hydrogen bond, uh, your hydrogen containing bonds will be vibrate too fast with respect to the time step. But in most cases, for QMMM, it is kind of okay to have one femtosecond time step. If you see, if you want to study the problem connecting to the, which connects somehow to the vibrations of hydrogen, for example, if you want to transfer, uh, to study transfer of hydrogen from one group to another, of hopping from one water to another, or between the uh, protein, uh, in, inside the protein between several amino acids, then I would suggest you to reduce the time step to 0 0.5 femtosecond or even lower. Uh, Mert is asking in other bio cell QMM workshops, it's also part where you modify the angel parameter uh, in topology. Is that necessary or are you conducting say? Uh, yeah, so idea is that uh, here it is done, all done automatically, I guess. Yeah. So the interface takes care of all that kind of parameters. Uh, so you don't need to do anything by your hand in adjusting parameters. Uh, but I see what you are uh, implying that uh, the, usually the hydrogen does not have any repulsion parameters. Yeah, so you, it hadn't any any repulsion. The hydrogen does not have any uh, Van der Waals parameters. Yes, it's true, and it's true that it could be a problem. I would suggest you to always check if your uh, hydrogen atom from your water or from another part tries to collapse onto your, your, onto your current part. If it is the case, then yes, better to add to that hydrogen uh, repulsive Lennard-Jones potential because it, it is artificial thing. Uh, yes, for that, yes. So the, uh, uh, Thomas uh, Mert, uh, actually, additionally, you are, we are also not providing any uh, topology files to CP2K. Also, this interface, so the, the, the charge of atoms through the PDB file. Yes, you are correct. So that's the uh, advantage of the interface, that you don't need to provide almost any topology to the CP2K. Uh, the Gromax is doing it for you. And the Gromax takes care of the MM part, of the MM topology. The CP2K only see the uh, QM atoms and point charges around that QM atoms. That's all he see. And everything else is treated by Gromax. Uh, uh, Umesh asks, how frequently does one dump the coordinates into the output? Uh, it's up to you clearly, <laughs> I can say. Uh, just be warned that, well, practically, usually I am doing this each step in QMM setup because you you cannot have as many uh, as you can uh, as many steps as you are doing with usual md but it's up to you how many and how you want to deal with the gigabytes or even bigger uh, files uh, yeah it's uh, i would say i would say as as frequently as you can afford <laughs> uh, yes which makes sense uh yes yes it just affects it this output does not affect uh uh like at all the speed of your qmm simulation because anywhere the qm will be a limiting factor bottleneck of your simulation so the output is not here the limiting factor like a normal classical md uh, so you can do as frequently as you want as as much as you can afford or analyze afterwards okay I suppose most of the people done with that uh, part seven to nine, and here I show what should be as a result. So if you if you you can also download trajectory and render it if you want. Uh, so and here is what you see in the temperature. So uh, actually that's what usually see uh, what happens 
when you switch your system from MM to QM. So basically here initial frame was a frame taken from the classical and Git trajectory. And that's what happens usually when you instantaneously switch uh, from MM to QM. So you see a huge jump in temperature because your quantum system, uh, quantum part starts relaxing from the force field uh, bond lengths, angles and so on. And you see a huge jump in temperature because you, your uh, energy starts dropping and you see increase of kinetic energy at the same, your potential energy drops and your kinetic energy increases and you see that uh, temperature jump. And then the thermostat starts to equilibrate your system. So that's why I've told you at some point before that you always need to relax. After the MD trajectory, you always need to relax your system for some time with QMMM and then with the ensemble just to make sure that your uh, system is well equilibrated for QM. Uh, yes. So that was the idea of that uh, uh, thing. Uh, that's the idea of that exercise. So to see that ha ha what happening when you switch your topology from Q MM to QM instantaneously on one step. Uh, okay, so let's move to the uh, uh, next exercise. And that in that exercise, I want to show you uh, what will look like if you set up a really huge protein system. And for that system, I've used one of the proteins which I'm working with. So it's so-called phytochrome protein. It's really huge protein. Uh, it's photoactive protein. It contains on standard residue chromophore here uh, in the pockets. There is two of them here and there. And uh, the objective, uh, objective of the original uh, work was to, uh, to uh, using the umbrella sampling to uh, make the isomerization profile of that chromophore from that position to that position. So it's basically a ring flip uh, from that to that. And uh, yeah, uh, QM part here will be a chromophore plus several uh, amino acid residues around. So it's re it will be really big system. It's around 85 quantum atoms, something like that. And for the QM method, we'll still use a PBE uh, functional and amount for field is amber zero three. So yeah, do the steps one to three. You can also download and render uh, your the system in your in any software package you want. So, but it's already really a big protein, and you will notice how slower the simulation will be when you run it. Uh, yeah, also it contains, I think, around 70 to 80,000 mm point charges, if I'm not mistaken, but it's kind of a big system. Uh, so there are several uh, questions, yes, thanks. Uh, so Mert asking, what happens in to total mm charts afterwards to include some side chains? Do we need to modify the charge in one system or to remain the same? Yes, so that's one of the problems which I am now trying to solve in the, uh, as a addition to the interface. So if you look into the output of the Grom PP, it notifies you uh, at some point that your uh, mm, total MM, QM plus MM charge should be in principle the same as it was before in, 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 in MM system. However, uh, especially in the protein case, usually your QM plus MM charge will be not zero and even not the, uh, the, uh, the value that you want it to be. So what to do with that? For now, the interface warns you that you have excess charge and uh, you need manually to spread it uh, along this. You don't need, uh, usually it's not so important. It's usually a small charge but you need to spread it uh, along the nearby MM atoms to, to, uh, to have the same MM charge as it was before. I'm still thinking how it can be automatized because it's not so easy problem. Mm, but if your charge is small enough, so if it's not like minus one or minus two exchange charge, then you could simply use uh, non zero charge. It will not harm much. Uh, Yes, that from my experience, I usually do, do not do that unification. It works quite fine. Uh, so.
So if you distribute, what if you distribute the remaining surplus charge the same residue proportionally on the negative sense, but but yes, so that's what you need to do. And that what, uh, if you look into the ground PP output, that what uh, 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 interface suggests you to do. Uh, so you just need to, usually, usually how it is done, it is done that you spread that excess charge uh, onto the MM atoms nearby to the QM part in order to keep total charge the same as it was before the in MM system. Uh, uh, so Shudrashan asks, uh, I suppose simulation can be restarted the same way as it do classical simulation Gromax. Correct. So you can use a restart uh, CPT uh, files generated by the uh, Gromax. You can, yes, you, you can do the CPT restart from the CPT checkpoint files, or you can regenerate and restart. Yeah, so I can regenerate TPR and restart from, or you can use CPT files. Uh, however, I would suggest you to uh, then uh, put additional option uh, to the MDRAN. I think it should be minus CPT, uh, minus CPT. So the time interval between the, which the Gromax writes that CPT files, uh, it's in real time. So you should they put it to something like minus CPT 0 0.1 or something like that. So it will write CPT file on each step. Uh, of your QMMM simulation. Uh, that's what I suggest usually to do, but yes, you can use CPT to start. Uh, uh, so the, in, in addition, Merit asking, uh, so I can divide surplus charge among the residues remaining in the MM and subtract from them individually. I would suggest to divide this charge uh, around the, uh, onto the MM atoms, which are really nearby to the QM system. Uh, to the broken QM bond. So you have a bond which are broken yeah, between QM and MM parts. That's why you have this charge. And I suggest to put them onto the onto the first atom, onto the next atoms. And you can define them yeah, like evenly. Uh, is a standard practice to perform, uh, Matthew asked, is a standard practice to perform a QM immunity assembly possible? I, I know you mentioned that NPT is possible, but you didn't recommend, so just Curiously, why? So yes, uh, typically uh, the NVT ensemble. I would prefer the doing the NVT ensemble because NPT is just. So I mean, it, it makes sense because uh, in practice, all ensembles uh, should give you the same results in a long distance trajectories. Yeah, like this ergoidal hypothesis tells you about that. But but uh, with uh, pressure coupling, what could happen? Now what happens with pressure coupling is that you are start changing your, uh, because how usually the pressure coupling is done in all microdynamic software, you start changing the dimensions of your box. Yeah. And of course, it's not feasible to change dimensions of your, uh, you can change freely the dimensions of your MM box pretty easily. It is very well known algorithms, but you cannot really change the dimensions of your QM box if you, effectively because once you start changing the dimension of your QM box, you are uh, changing your plane wave basis set. And you cannot do that in, 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 because you start changing your QM system. How it is implemented, for example, in Gromax QM, or in CP2K QMLM uh, dynamics in normal, uh, they are always use the same QM box for calculating QM part, but they also have a fake QM box to pressure coupling. Uh, so <laughs> it's it, it makes uh, your life even more miserable. So I, I've also made that easier. So now the pressure coupling is fully uh, implemented in Gromax. So Gromax take care of that. And how it takes care, it scales only the MM box. It does not touch the QM box at all. Uh, so in a sense, you don't have a pressure coupling of your QM part. But except of that, then PT works quite well. You can also try that yourself if you want. Uh, yeah. But I would suggest for QMM, especially in CPU2K, to just stick to the NVT ensemble. You can do a preliminary NPT equilibration with uh, normal molecular dynamics and then switch to NVT and use NVT. Yes. Okay. So I think most of the people done with uh, parts steps one to three and 
let's continue. Open, uh, you can open that less uh, with less the uh, phytochrome input file. And what you see will be in QMMM appears additional uh, section called link, uh, several link sections. And uh, in that link sections, what it is, it is basically, uh, it defines the broken bonds between the uh, QM and the MM part, like in that case of protein. For example, here is our QM part. And what you see here is that 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 here, 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 and here, your carbons doesn't have full valences, yeah? And of course, this is not allowed in the quantum chemistry, dangling bonds, kind of. This will, uh, this, will, uh, this will be a very bad for the QM. So what in reality is going on, you're setting up that you're saying, okay, between these two atoms, we have a, a broken covalent bond, and it informs the uh, CP2K that it needs to generate here additional fake atom, which is not which is not used in any real simulations, but it just caps additional hydrogen atom will cap this uh, free bond. And after the QM uh, calculation it will be removed back. So the force from that uh, QM atom will just go onto the nearby QM and the MEM atom will be redistributed and this atom will be removed. So but it just uh, informs CP2K okay that it needs to cap these broken bonds. Uh, by fake atom. Uh, it's called link atom, I guess. It was also in the lecture. Uh, okay, so in a way, the result of this simulation I could show you. So basically, uh, yeah, we, we cannot make it further because it's really hard simulation. It takes months to simulate fully. But in reality, what you can get on the output is something like that. Uh, so it's again the uh, umbrella sampling of that reaction, of that reaction coordinate. Uh, so it's very smooth kind of profile, but it took almost a 40 picoseconds per. So there was like a 20 again uh, frames, each several degrees. You have a frame, and it is uh, simulated each frame for like. 30 to 40 picoseconds. So it's really long simulation. So one simulation took approximately a couple of weeks. So <laughs> of real computing time. So it's really hard problem. But that's what really you, you are usually dealing with uh, in the real uh, life. And that's why also important, very important thing, that's why you need a supercomputers. You cannot do this simple kind of simulations on your laptop. Uh, yeah, you need you, you need supercomputers, and that's why the Arno, me, and Holly uh, also trying to, to to make you uh, getting to you know how to use them. Uh, okay, I think this is end for today. Uh, practical, so you can continue uh, your continue doing uh, whatever you did not done. So I think now uh, it still should work. Uh, so thanks for your attention. Uh, we are ready for some questions. So I see already a question from Victoria. Does code run mostly on CPU and GPU? Uh, this code is now run only on the CPU. Uh, we do not use GPU. Uh, however, we have a plans to also make it work with GPU in the future. I guess yes, Arno, according to what we have contacts yeah, now. Certainly. I mean so R22, for yeah. example, doesn't have GPUs. So that's yeah. why certainly right now we're not using it with GPUs, but in principle it should be possible. Um, we know Chromex of course takes very good advantage of GPUs. CP2K can also uh, the actual advantage that you will get will depend on the system. Um, but that is that is um, yeah, something that we will providing guidance on in the future. So tomorrow Oli will talk a bit about performance and um, it will be mostly about performance. Actually, I think almost exclusively, well, totally on CPU. But the idea is that there is a best practice guide, uh, which you'll refer to, and we will in future expand that to include guidance on how to get performance on, on CPU plus GPU. Can't we still utilize Gromox to use GPU? Uh, yeah, you can. I mean, it will be totally fine, but there is no point to do that for now because your bottleneck in the QMM calculations always the QM part. Uh, regardless, so regardless of anything, the Gromax, I mean the MM calculation and the integration step takes less than 0.01% of the total time. So 
uh, why why it should use GPU is not clear for me. The good thing will be once we can make the interface, uh, once we could make in the interface use of CPU by CP2K. If CP2K can efficiently use GPU, it will be much more uh, increasing in, in uh, speed than uh, for Gromox. Yeah, you can, you can. Uh, so I mean, the answer to the math question is yes, you can. Uh, but but uh, there is not a big point to do that for now. But we, yeah, you, you gain not next to nothing. You can even see a degradation of the performance because uh, the time to submit uh, the time of exchange between a CPU and GPU uh, will be more than the actual calculation time on the GPU. It's, it will be not a huge degradation. I mean, again, again around 0.0 percent. But uh, yeah, uh, there is no point for now to do that. Yes, uh, once we can get into the uh, to the GPU using CP GPU for CP2K simulations, it will be much more uh, clear why you should do that. Okay. Yeah. So uh, thanks very much, Dimitri. <laughs> uh, good sessions.